So welcome everybody to this event in the OECD uh, virtual pavilion for COP26. And we're going to have a session today on losses and damages from climate change, focusing on the role of finance. So we're really very pleased to, to welcome you all today and, and to welcome our participants and speakers as well. And uh, I just wanted to mention at the outset that we do have English, French, interpretation available and that's uh, if you're on the zoom app it's the little interpretation button on the bottom you'll be able to see that this is actually the the second uh, sort of launch event we've had uh, for the report we 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 did a, a, a major launch last week in in glasgow um, and the report that we launched is given the full title of managing climate risks facing up to losses and damages and I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed to uh, our colleagues in the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation for their support throughout this project. And I'm hoping that they're going to be able to join us in a little bit. Uh, but no doubt events in Glasgow are still taking a lot of time and attention. So the report we've just launched explains um, the approaches to reducing and managing losses and damages, both those occurring now and those that will occur in the future. And it provides some new insights into the three main types of climate hazard that we're facing. Slow onset changes like the sea level rise, extreme weather events of which we've seen plenty in 2021, and the famous tipping points, these thresholds in the earth system that can trigger quite dramatic changes in the whole climate system. And it also provides an in-depth analysis of the associated uncertainties in our understanding of those hazards and how they interact with the natural and social environments. These have significant implications for policy, these uncertainties, uh, for finance and also for technological responses and the capabilities that we need to reduce and manage the associated losses and damages. And the approaches to this are, are really detailed in, in the sort of second half of the report, the last three chapters of the report. So do have a look at that. As we all know, the impacts of climate change are already severe and are going to get worse. Um, this, this threatens lives, livelihoods, even social and economic stability and viability of some countries and regions, as well as the environment on which we all depend. Marginalized populations, communities, both within and across countries are particularly vulnerable and future generations will carry the burden for inadequate climate action by past and current generations. So uh, this is a critical moment. Now, when we talk about climate risks, this isn't just the nature and intensity of the climate hazards themselves, the physical hazards themselves, but, but also depend on the exposure and vulnerability of people, assets and ecosystems um, to those hazards. So the responsibility in a sense for current and future losses and damages from climate change is a shared responsibility across developed and developing countries. Clearly, developed countries and large, rapidly growing and emissions intensive developing economies have to take a lead in, in mitigating emissions if we are to limit future hazards in line with the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. And the proliferation of net zero pledges that we've seen in recent days and weeks are very welcome, but we now need specific plans and actions, more importantly if we're to, to make the unprecedentedly rapid reductions in greenhouse gases that are needed this decade to keep a 1.5 degree goal within reach. And when I say unprecedentedly rapid, of course, we saw that in 2020 during the pandemic, we saw this, this massive drop in emissions, but that has to be sustained going forward for several years more. Now, in terms of the exposures and vulnerabilities, these are, in a sense, determined by a range of complex historical and current processes. And um, we, we obviously need to complement this, this, this emphasis on mitigation by also trying to reduce exposure and, and increase resilience and reduce vulner vulnerability, particularly for the most disadvantaged communities. And in many developing countries, such action is going to, be need, is going to need support technical, financial, and capacity building from the international community. 
but it's important that the actions are owned by the, the governments themselves. And so individual governments, whether it's for mitigation or for exposure and vulnerability, adaptation actions, individual governments have critical responsibility to deliver on their commitments towards the Paris Agreement. Um, but success is going to require solidarity across and within nations. It's going to require effective institutions and coherent policies that set the right incentives across the economy. It's going to require innovative partnerships, both within countries and internationally, new technologies and transformative approaches, as well, of course, as investments to increase risks. And the reality is that the risks of losses and damage from climate change are very unevenly distributed across people and geographies. So, for example, many least developed countries and small island developing states that were the focus of the report are particularly vulnerable. And uh, Nicolene is going to put up a slide now showing um, the impact of, of hurricanes on Dominica's debt to GDP ratio. And when these tropical cyclones or hurricanes, you know, often supercharged by climate change, strike repeatedly over a few years, they can really threaten a country's fiscal sustainability and long term development. Yeah. The, the example we have here is Dominica's debt to GDP ratio. And you can see the major hurricanes superimposed on this and, and how the debt GDP shoots up after a hurricane, begins to recover again. But then when you get two, two more hurricanes coinciding as we here, have here you know, in, in 2019, it, it, it really gets very hard for countries to, to, to recover. And, and it's this continued repeated event, extreme event, that, that we're worried about in terms of, 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 for example, here, fiscal sustainability. Another country, Mozambique, um, was hit uh, in 2019 by a couple of cyclones early in the year, and that pushed GDP, debt to GDP, over 100%. And then it was hit again by two others in 2021. I mean, really, really bad luck. And um, the debt GDP ratio was then projected to reach 125% of GDP by the end of 2021. So these are these are real ongoing problems that countries face. Perhaps we can just take the slides off for a second. And uh, yeah, that's it. Next next slide's coming up anyway. Okay. So fiscal sustainability is therefore going to constrain the ability of governments to pursue their broader sustainable development objectives, including, of course, in that adaptation and mitigation. And at the same time, address you know, poverty and other priorities within the country. So money that should have gone to education, health, care, infrastructure is likely to get diverted to emergency responses, rehabilitation and reconstruction. And the access to new finance, of course, can be limited if um, these, these disasters increase the costs of borrowing, for example. So now moving on to this second slide, um, the report um, looks at, at financial interventions, if you like, in three, three distinct categories. And these are risk reduction, risk retention, and risk transfer. And you can see these um, highlighted on this chart in respect to both governments and households and businesses, and in terms of, of, of the insurance industry, but also in terms of, of, of the capital markets more broadly. And risk reduction is absolutely central to, to any attempts to reduce and manage losses and damages. It, We've talked about the need to reduce hazard, but here in, the, in, in this finance context, um, what, what's needed is to provide an enabling environment for households and businesses to manage their own risks. And that's really important um, because we need to limit, if you like, the contingent liabilities that then feed back an impact on, on the government's fiscal risks. And you can see that in that little circle between the households and the governments there. And talking about risk retention, this is something that, you know, is a practice to, to manage fairly low intensity, but, you know, regularly recurring events. And it's, it's basically governments keeping reserve funds or households and businesses keeping some savings for a rainy day. And, um, you know, th those are effective to a limit, but they, they, they soon become overwhelmed if, if the events are too frequent or too intense. And so this is where we need risk transfer as well. To, to share and pool um, these, these risks amongst parties that are better able to, to, to cover them and to address them. And I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot more about that today. So um, 
We'll take the slides off now, I think, Nicolina. Uh, thanks very much. There's no one size fits all solution to these problems, and a lot depends on the country context. The appropriate mix of risk reduction, retention, and transfer will therefore vary according to the relative costs and benefits of those different mechanisms in comparison to the hazards that they are aimed at addressing. So today we'll focus on the role of finance in reducing and managing the risks of losses and damages with different perspectives, aiming to highlight good practice and some limitations and also some priorities for action in the finance area. And I, I'm really pleased to say we're joined by a, a great second set of speakers today uh, to share their insights. But before we, we start with, with the, the main panelists, let me turn to my colleague, Jens Sedemund, who's the head of the Environment and Development Cooperation Unit within the OECD's Development Cooperation Director. And he'll briefly outline some insights on the role of development cooperation in supporting partner countries in reducing and managing the risks of losses and damage. So Jens, over to you. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, um, welcome also from my part to, to everybody uh, and, and to our panelists, as well as uh, all those who are following the events. Um, now, as Simon mentioned uh, on our side, we look at the issue mostly through the lens of development cooperation and uh, donor support. And uh, I think uh, the first thing that also Simon abundantly made clear is that uh, climate-related losses and damages are very much a reality of the development. And they very much and very directly affect development, both in terms of the current state and its further progress and future prospects. And that's obviously particularly clear and, and relevant for highly vulnerable countries that are exposed to climate hazards, such as LDCs and small island development states. So that means that the issue is also very immediately linked to donor mandates and the way in which support developing countries in achieving their development objectives. Now, what the report uh, has done is try to provide some preliminary estimates of flows from DAC members, as well as multilateral providers that address losses and damages. And what we've found is basically a range uh, of between uh, 1. billion US dollars on average uh, during the 2018 and 19 uh, period. Um, and that is for a narrow set of activities, such as disaster risk reduction, immediate post-emergency reconstruction or preparedness. But then uh, it, that goes to uh, 6.8 uh, billion uh, of US uh, dollars a year, the same timeline, if we take into account a broader set of sectors related to activities uh, to help reduce and manage the risks of losses and damages um, in developing countries. Now, Basically, we use this range because it's really difficult to assess the exact financial contribution that donors are making to climate related loss and damages. Um, and, you know, to really draw clear borders with uh, other, other supports uh, that they provide. For instance, you know, where again is, is the border uh, with the post disaster reconstruction uh, that may you know, or may not or to some extent be climate related. Uh, support uh, to capacity to better manage, reduce, um, and, and eliminate risks of losses um, and many other areas that are typically very much uh, the, the business of development cooperation. Um, what is clear, however, is that uh, donors have been and will continue to be key supporters of developing countries in moving this agenda forward. Now, there are three quick examples that I would like to give in this regard uh, of, of how donors basically focus on and increase their focus on this issue. First, uh, what we found is that uh, donors in their activities are increasingly factoring in the reality of losses and damages. And that applies to their strategic thinking and programming, um, not only through climate change adaptation or disaster risk reduction. So for instance, uh, we found that donors like Germany, Denmark, but also the Green Climate Fund now include losses and damages in their new strategies and have started implementing projects that specifically target the issue. The second point is that donors focus on how to support partner country capacity to access climate related finance, and that focus is actually increasing. Now, access to finance is a much broader and quite overarching concern for partner countries when it comes to climate finance, but actually when it comes to overall development financing overall. And clearly more needs to be done to ensure that uh, uh, you know, countries have the ability to access that and, and uh, enhance their capacity to adapt and build resilience and uh, face the risks of climate related losses and damages. 
Uh, but again, and we found that efforts such as the Green Climate Fund and Jeff or also Team Europe uh, are really looking to coordinate procedures, uh, um, how to help countries, especially those where capacities are most stretched uh, and their ability to access financial resources um, are most constrained, basically. And that, again, applies very much to um, climate change broadly, but also increasingly there's an understanding and a focus on the issue of losses and damages here. Now, a third point is that uh, donors are also increasingly connecting the dots between humanitarian and development cooperation efforts. Basically, this is to ensure that short-term humanitarian action can also better incorporate anticipation and preparedness action which can then contribute to medium and longer term sustainable development. It's quite clear that the communities still have to learn quite a bit from each other, uh, but the report has found a number of good examples of how this is being done and also how developing countries are doing this, especially, uh, or for instance, in Bangladesh or the Philippines through early warnings, warning systems and social protection mechanisms. Now, at the same time, it's also quite clear that more needs to be done uh, and there are in particular, three priorities that we have identified for future donor actions. One is basically that as donors increase pledges, that hopefully should result in, in sharp increases in climate-related uh, development assistance, including for loss and damages, there also needs to be more work done to underpin this funding with a clear policy and a clear approach to the issue. For the most part, uh, this has still to be developed by donors so that they actually can integrate losses and damages more coherently and systematically into their broader development programs. The second point is that resources will always be scarce as basically a definition of economics. Um, so effectiveness is key. Um, and as an example, donor coordination um, can do a lot to help reduce and absorb some of the transaction costs that otherwise threaten to overburden the partners in developing countries. Um, it also includes efforts to simplify the current landscape of climate-related finance, where again, coordination and harmonized approaches could go a very long way uh, to reduce uh, uh, the burdens and transactions costs associated with this. Similarly, ownerships and partnerships are central. Um, and uh, their donor efforts can not only support or align with, uh, with, with ownership, but through partnerships, uh, enable ownership, for instance, through a long-term uh, support for local capacity development. Um, finally, I think there's a sense, and that goes again to a point also that Simon made, that there's a need to take a broader outlook at the financing needs and realities uh, of developing countries. Um, there is a clear concern in some countries in long-term debt sustainability and uh, debt distress is already a reality for many developing countries. Donor support clearly needs to be aligned with fiscal sustainability, especially given a future outlook where climate-related shocks are frequent and likely to intensify and have very significant macro impacts. On the other hand, there's also clearly an increasing interest to how the preservation and sustainable net management of natural assets that many developing countries have and that do deliver uh, or provide a service for the global community can be turned to their advantage. So I think this is a, a still an area where lots of work and expectation is to be happened, um, but really one uh, that is very significant in this context. Great. To Thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Just, just, just a very sense. I think very to conclude, losses and damages is very much a part of development. Uh, I think it needs to provide for continued development the way that is, uh, this is integrated by uh, donors, um, both in terms of um, you know, the ability to address losses and damages, but also the simple fact that the more developing countries can achieve development progress, the more capacities they will have, the more resources they will be able to mobilize and finance to access, the better they will be able to manage uh, this challenge. So back to you. Um, and over for me. Thanks, Anna. Great. Thanks very much, Jen. Sorry to, to just uh, jump the gun there. So let me first um, now turn to um, our first our first sort of panelist, and I'm really pleased to welcome Omar Sisse Sao, who's a technical and commercial director for the National Agriculture Insurance Company of Senegal. And 
just wanted to ask you, Omar, and, and again, there's this interpretation at the button for French English translation. Um, what are the levers by which insurance can help manage the risks of losses and damages from climate change? So, no mark. Merci. Uh, C'est un plaisir pour moi de participer à ce panel sur les pertes et dommages dus au changement climatique et quel rôle en fait le secteur financier devrait y jouer. Alors, euh, pour répondre à votre question, euh, je dirais que tout d'abord, permettez-moi, euh, après m'avoir réjoui de participer en fait à ce, à ce panel, de vous présenter la, la compagnie d'assurance agricole, qui est une société issue d'un partenariat public-privé, donc implanté par le gouvernement sénégalais et qui a en charge uniquement la gestion des risques agricoles au Sénégal. Et sa mise en œuvre, en fait, fait de cette société qu'on appelle CNAS, un pionnier en matière de couverture et de gestion des risques agricoles dans toute la zone d'Afrique de l'Ouest. Alors, avec l'appui des partenaires techniques et des partenaires au développement, la CNAS est arrivée à mettre sur pied un programme d'assurance indicielle qui est en fait une stratégie phare en, fait en matière de mesures d'atténuation et d'adaptation face au, au changement climatique. Alors, par rapport à votre question sur les leviers, aujourd'hui, euh, à mon humble avis, les leviers par lesquels euh, l'assurance euh, pouvait appuyer en fait, à, à gérer les risques et les pertes sont pour moi euh, une forte implication du gouvernement, euh, notamment dans, dans un pays ou bien dans n'importe quel pays, il faudrait une forte implication, une volonté politique institutionnelle du gouvernement matérialisée par les ministères qui sont en charge, qui ont, qui sont, qui, qui ont en charge dans leur portefeuille le secteur agricole, l'élevage. On a tendance à oublier le secteur de l'élevage qui fait partie quand même du secteur primaire. Donc, c'est un secteur important. Donc, il faut euh, comme premier en fait, levier une forte implication du gouvernement. Comme deuxième levier, euh, il y a la nécessité d'avoir l'intégration en fait, de, de l'assurance agricole dans tous les projets et programmes euh, de développement euh, dans, dans le pays en question. Et ça passe par le fait de jumeler l'ensemble des actions sur l'intégration de l'assurance dans les programmes, dans la politique agricole en fait, du pays, mais aussi ça passe en fait, par euh, le fait qu'il y a nécessité pour le ministère qui a en charge de l'agriculture d'intégrer une composante assurance agricole dans ses projets et programmes. Et pour le ministère de l'élevage, il faudrait en fait qu'il appuie le financement du secteur de l'élevage, incluant l'assurance. Pour moi, je pense que dans un pays, il faudrait qu'on arrive à subventionner aussi ce secteur d'assurance qui fait partie du secteur de la micro-assurance, donc avec une cible en fait très démunie, avec des revenus très faibles. Sans la subvention, ils ne pourront pas prendre en charge l'assurance. Je pense que pour moi, c'est sur ces points-là que compte en fait les euh, que, que repose sur les leviers sur lesquels on doit s'appuyer pour développer un programme d'assurance. Merci. Thank you so much, Omar. Merci beaucoup. Uh, great pleasure to have you here today. Thank, thank you very much for those remarks. And I wanted now to turn to a perspective from a, a different continent, and Dr. Deepshika Sharma, who's a climate and environment specialist at the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development in Nepal. So, uh, Deepshika, what approaches are mountainous countries taking to reduce and manage the risks of losses and damages? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, and thank you, uh, other panelists who has joined this session. Am I audible? That's fine. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm sorry, there is some issue with my camera. But uh, I just wanted to, first of all, highlight a few points here. Uh, for example, when we are talking about especially of the this part of the world, which is called Asia, South Asia, it is mainly currently facing 
what has been described as the worst monsoon season on the past decades, you know, which have faced this year as well, affecting approximately 17.5 million people across different countries like India, Bangladesh, Nepal, etc. Uh, only in India, you know, in one of the states, about 5.7 million uh, people have been hit by the with the total loss of property, crops, estimated of uh, USD 306 million. And uh, all these are being faced every year by the floods from various rivers, Brahmaputra, one of the Asia's largest rivers, originates in Tibetan Valley. Millions of people are, you know, as we know, are their homes and livelihoods worst hit as well. And impacts of these when combined crisis re-emphasize the need for financing to address the residual unavoidable losses and damages from climate impacts that are not being tackled through adaptation and risk reduction strategies alone. Finance has been a key element in conversation about both climate change and COVID-19 over the past few months uh, and almost a year now, uh, especially on the green recovery and building back better. In these contexts, finance has meant redirecting recovery investments away from the carbon intensive industries, rather to promote greener climate compatible investments. Various communities in Asia and South Asia, you know, basically has been sandwiched in a triple disaster of flooding, COVID, and an associated socioeconomic crisis of loss of livelihoods and jobs. <laughs> it will also hold, you know, in kind of developed countries, we have seen that committed to mobilizing approximately 100 billion USD of climate finance per year to address the needs of developing countries, but to date have been far from meeting this, these targets. Establishing a loss and damage fund would demonstrate that developed countries are serious about the meeting this commitment and it should strengthen the trade relations among the various nations. Just to highlight a few more points here, you know, I would like to dwell a little bit more on the vulnerabilities of the Hindu Kush Himalaya regions. Recently in this HKH assessment report, it's been estimated that the role of this region with the with which spread across eight countries is in achieving this zero carbon and climate resilient future, which we would all like to see. Uh, it has nearly 20% of its landmass under snow cover, largest reserves of ice outside the polar regions, home to four global diversity, biodiversity hotspots, and source of 10 meter Asian river system, and habitated by two, approximately 240 million people living in the mountains, and approximately 1.65 billion plus living downstream. So it is almost half of the humanity which depends upon the food produced in the HKH river basins. Climate change is already having a severe impact, uh, whether it is related to the water issues, um, temperature issues. And so there is, we can see that there is a meltdown of the third pole and the major losses of biodiversity. As a result, the people of these regions are more frequent towards the climate disasters, leading to the loss of lives, livelihoods, negative impacts. Glacial lake outburst floods is also becoming a very common phenomenon. So in order to, uh, mitigate or in order to control or in order to uh, have the options of uh, minimizing the loss and damages, there have been a lot of measures put forward by the various eight member countries uh, in this particular HKH region. Starting off, I would like to a little bit highlight on the very important aspect, which is the social economic governance and policy aspect. A lot of countries are developing policies to help vulnerable and adversely impacted during the COVID-19. There has been an economic response and recovery measures, which is not only protecting the jobs, but also focusing a lot on the private sectors, which in our uh, part of the world is small and medium sized enterprises and informal sector workers. There's also empowering the peoples and building resilience, improvisation in terms of education, healthcare, creating new livelihoods, supports farmers and small businesses. A very important aspect is inclusion, gender inclusion, climate resilience, balanced regional development and private sector participation in order to build back better. And there is a very, a very uh, deep focus on the social cohesion and community resilience. Some of the priority areas which I would like to mention uh, whether we take various examples, uh, I can definitely talk more about it. For example, countries like Bangladesh, Bhutan, they have put forward their uh, Nepal, India, China, they have all of them have put forward. Just a second, I think there's some noise at mine. Hello, Deepshika. Yeah, they have put forward the net zero commitments. So, for example, in order to start, uh, there is a lot of focus on the recovery, response, and redesign. 
ministries have various ministries uh, can i can i just share some examples here is that well i think if if we can perhaps get to those later i think we've got a few people still want to speak so okay okay so i'll just in the next manage. few seconds yes. yeah that would be yeah great. yeah yeah i'll just quickly manage them yeah so but just to focus upon what exactly is required that uh, the, since there is a lot of focus on uh, building back better and uh, net zero carbon commitments it is very important for our uh, member countries to uh, work on the investment framework which uh, ec mode has also started working upon so we are in a process of um, introducing a mountains of opportunities investment framework at COP, wherein we are, uh, along with our eight member countries, are focusing on scaling up the investments for the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. Thank you. That's brilliant. Th thank you so much, Dushka, and thanks very much for just uh, winding up there. We've, we've, we've got another three people yet, and then want to try and take some questions as well. But I think the examples you've just given uh, you know, really underline the, the challenges of the region, and uh, you've given a great a great overview of, of 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 the work that you're undertaking as well to begin to address those. So th thank you very much, really valuable. Um, next, I just wanted to introduce Dr. Jürgen Zattler. He's the Director General of the International Development Policy 2030 Agenda on Climate in the German in German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ, as it's better known as perhaps to some. And uh, great pleasure to have you here, Jürgen. And thanks very much to the Ministry for the support that you've extended for this project over the last 15 months or so. Just wanted to ask you um, about the financial tools that are available at the international level to help countries to manage the risks of losses and damages from climate change. Yeah, thanks a lot and thanks for inviting me. Thanks uh, for having conducted this study. Um, I think it's already uh, um, under discussion here in, in Glasgow. Uh, so I think it, it, it has been a, a good contribution and I think it, it, it will continue to enrich uh, the, uh, the discussion. So with regard to, to your uh, question, uh, we already have a landscape uh, of support. Uh, the elements of this uh, landscape are manifold and range from risk uh, assessment and reduction efforts in all sectors, almost all sectors. It also encompasses um, contingency planning, risk finance to adaptive social protection, to forecast um, based uh, finance. So we already have such a, a landscape. And a lot of actors already deliver their contribution. For example, many multilateral institutions such as uh, the, the World Bank Group, and uh, Bernice will take the floor later, um, devise strategies to assess uh, climate risks and also to alleviate uh, the impacts of adverse effects of climate change and contribute uh, to strengthen resilience. Um, one instrument which is close to our and my heart uh, are CAT DDO, so Catastrophe Deferred Drawdown Options, uh, but also development policy lending. So policy lending, uh, because there we can address uh, the policy issues, uh, which are sometimes um, an impediment and can also help uh, to address the issues uh, with regard to, to losses. Uh, another problem are debt sustainability analysis, economic and debt impacts of climate induced shocks differ considerably among countries. Among other things, uh, they hinge on the quality of crisis preparedness and investments in resilience. Therefore, it is critical that debt sustainability, sustainability analysis adequately reflect both the risks and the factors of resilience. And of course, adjustments required for debt treatments have to enable strengthening resilience to avoid vicious circles in the future. And therefore, I very much welcome the fact that the World Bank and IMF uh, acknowledge the macro criticality of uh, climate and climate risk. A recent work of the IMF on Resilience and Sustainability Trust is really highly relevant in that context. And this will require good collaboration between the two institutions which we are promoting we are really supporting forcefully, in particular the World Bank, in uh, 
uh, drawing up the instruments needed, in particular in the policy area. We're also supporting a diverse portfolio in the field of uh, climate and disaster risk finance and insurance under the umbrella of the insurance um, Insure Resilience Global Partnership, which you know. The central initiative is the Global Risk Financing Facility, the so-called GRIF, which supports the implementation of the CDRFI components within the World Bank Group projects. And so another important instrument uh, and, and, and initiative we support are risk uh, pools, regional risk pools in particular, like the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, and also in the Pacific, uh, the same. Uh, so I can tell you the, the numbers. Um, uh, we are uh, there investing, uh, but perhaps uh, time uh, is short, and I better stop here. Over to you. Thank you, Jürgen. Um, great to have you here, and thanks, thanks for that uh, brief canter over the landscape of, of, of finance relevant to losses and damages. And, now I, I'd like to welcome um, somebody from one of the institutions you mentioned, and that's Bernice van Bronckhorst, who's the um, Global Director for Climate Change at the World Bank. And if the internet's working, Bernice, I think you were saying you had some problems earlier, but hopefully it'll, it'll last the, the, the session. Um, I just wanted to really ask you about how the World Bank is uh, adapting to this changing reality where the risks of losses and damages from climate change are bound to increase actually um, it's a big challenge i guess great thank you thank you simon and thank you for inviting me um i'm i'm actually yeah i hope you can hear me and i hope you, it's not too loud because i i found the quietest corner at the in the cop pavilions <laughs> but as and many of you have probably been to a cop before it's a, it's very hard to find any quiet space anywhere so um, I, I hope you can uh, you can hear me and hope the internet holds up. But but yeah, again, thank you so much. Of course, this is um, is, is very close to our heart. Uh, this whole discussion at the um, at the World Bank Group, and I just want to um, you know commend the uh, the OECD for uh, you know for for the release of this report. Really, extremely timely and 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 very important report. Um, and of course, I also just want to thank my, my old friend and colleague Jürgen, who I see on the, you know, just spoke before me. Um, it's really uh, wonderful to have you to see you there and also to acknowledge a really, really great collaboration on this agenda together um, with, um, um, with our German colleagues. But just for this purpose, for this conversation today, I just wanted to highlight uh, maybe four, um, four points um, that I, uh, I wanted to share about, you know, the World Bank's thinking, as you point out, in this um, increasingly um, uh, urgent agenda, um, you know, for us um, um, at the World Bank. So for the first point is really that, that finance, of course, is absolutely critical, um, you know, for climate action as a whole, but especially for resilience. And we see that, of course, many of our client countries, especially in IDA countries, um, as well as the small island states, etc. Um, the World Bank Group continues to be the leading source of climate finance for developing countries. We actually managed a record of about 26 billion um, in the last fiscal year, which was in spite of COVID or on top of COVID. So we're actually really, really very proud of that. Um, but of course, I think what is even more important for this discussion is that we have made the commitment um, already uh, a while back um, in our climate change action plan that at least 50% um, of all of our funding should go to adaptation. And that really is, again, what is so relevant for the, uh, you know, for the damage and loss discussion, of course. So half of that is going to adaptation. Going forward, 35% of all of our lending will also um, um, go to climate action, and half of which at least will be going to the adaptation agenda. So we're actually seeing increasingly, um, uh, particularly in the poorer client countries, that we're doing more than like 60% of all of our climate funding is going to adaptation um, um, as opposed to, to mitigation. And that's a trend that I think um, just, 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 I guess, you know, uh, highlights, you know, how important this issue is for many, for, for, for so many of these countries. Um, second point I wanted to make is really around the importance of mobilizing private capital. So, while of course, you know, the multilateral finance is essential, the kind of resources the World Bank, GCF, et cetera, can bring, 
we've of course also really learned that it's not sufficient to help countries uh, mitigate climate impacts and and it really needs to be enhanced with private capital and that it's really crucial as well that the public money the money that we bring is programmed in a way that we can mobilize this private capital so we can we need to use the limited public money that we have available to to be able to really uh, mobilize this private capital um, we released a joint world bank ifc report last year that some of you may have seen it lays out a blueprint for action um, to increase private finance for adaptation to minimize loss and damages in developing countries again this is a really complex area we haven't cracked the nuts yet but but we're really working very hard at trying to bring increased private sector mobilization or capital mobilization to the adaptation agenda. Um, we, um, we are also now um, uh, piloting this in a number of different countries. Um, and, um, and, and the report really identifies sort of five key entry points for, for, uh, for actions to catalyze private investment in resilience. And these of course include long-term adaptation planning, you know, the development of national adaptation plans so investment plans, so you can have a good idea of what are the sort of bankable projects and priorities. Um, thirdly, a market assessment, a pipeline screening. Um, then of course, then, you know, project preparation, transaction support and demonstration. But it's really, um, it's, it's really an area that we need to, I think, collectively step up efforts on to understand how we can, you know, um, add to the you know public finance by bringing in the private sector, which is really proven to be so tricky in in the area of, of adaptation. The third area that I wanted to highlight is just um, the need for us to tap into the power of financial markets. Um, really, financial markets um, are very adept at managing risks and in providing finance uh, to address those risks. So. As, uh, as Jürgen mentioned earlier, the World Bank's uh, global financing, global risk financing facility, the, or the GRIF as we call it, you know, works to do just that by increasing the financial resilience of developing countries with technical assistance and co-financing of financial instruments, including you know, different market-based instruments such as uh, insurance. So um, again, very happy to see our colleagues from Germany on this panel. And, um, and they are of course, you know, the largest donor to, to the GRIF including a, a very, very generous pledge that was just made here um, at the COP in Glasgow. So just to give an example on of how GRIF um, is mobilizing private capital for resilience. So the GRIF recently supported the government of Jamaica with placing um, the very first ever cat bond, the catastrophe bond in the Caribbean. And, um, and this cat bond is then sort of the fundamental pillar of Jamaica's disaster risk finance strategy, which is complemented by um, protection provided by national budget allocations and funds being programmed by donors. But again, this allows for a better smoothing um, of, the, of the burdens in case of a you know, particularly adverse uh, climate event. Um, the fourth point I wanted to make is just to say that uh, it's really critical to also pair the financial and operational preparedness. So we need, um, we really need to combine, again, I don't know if that makes sense, but the financial and the operational preparedness. So funding is crucial, but money alone is really insufficient and needs to be com combined with the operational preparedness in a way that complements um, and reinforces the finances. So again, to give an example of the World Bank's work, um, com combining this sort of financial operational preparedness. In Malawi, for example, as part of Malawi's uh, disaster risk financing strategy, the GRIF is providing support to both the design, the setup, and implementation of a disaster risk financing system to cover the cost of scaling up Malawi's main uh, cash transfer program. So again, uh, making sure that that preparedness is in place in case of a, uh, in, in the case of Malawi, uh, often a drought. Um, through this combination of financing and implementation support, the GRIF is helping, um, really helping the use to use the existing social protection infrastructure to mitigate the impact of disaster shock. So it's bringing together the operational setup, the delivery mechanism through the social protection mechanism, but bringing the financial aspects in there. Um, Final point maybe to say is that we also need to create incentives uh, for risk mitigation and finance. So we've really seen that the limited concessional finance that is available really must strive to create the right incentives for larger and more strategic mitigation and risk finance. 
Um, so again, just to say that we are ready to, to help countries analyze the different layers of risk and, and, and quantify the price of risk mitigation, and then really look into what are the different financial instruments um, that we can put uh, to bear um, that, and that can ensure that cheaper sources of finance like budget allocations, reserves, contingent credits um, are used for first, and that the more expensive uh, instruments like insurance are used to cover excess losses. So complicated you know, agenda, but absolutely critical um, for, um, you know, for, 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 you know, to, to support our, our clients um, in, 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 in the years to come. Let me leave it here, Simon. Thank you. Great. No, thank, thank you, Bernice. And great. You could join us. And now, absolutely, yeah, not least, certainly last, Hans-Jörg Strohmeyer, who's uh, the chief Policy Development and Studies Branch for the UN uh, Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And uh, as you I mean, how, how could providers of humanitarian and development cooperation work together and learn from each other to address these risks of losses and damages in a better way? So please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Simon. And um... Let me perhaps just uh, provide a small, a short sort of uh, humanitarian perspective uh, to, to, to all of this. Um, I, I can see uh, some of my colleagues are also at COP, so am I. Uh, so if it's noisy, uh, uh, my apologies. But many of us were in the room yesterday when President Obama um, uh, said, we're running out of time. And my spontaneous reaction was, well, uh, tens of millions of people have already run out of time. Um, and uh, for us, who've been on the front lines uh, really of climate change in so many places, um, we can see the consequences of this already daily. So for, for us, sort of um, climate change, not for us, we observe for those communities that we um, work for um, and, and with, for them, climate change today is already, it's real. And it's irreversible, and it's a daily um, struggle for survival. Maybe just a, a few uh, sort of very poignant uh, figures. Um, the 15 most climate change um, vulnerable countries, according to the Notre Dame um, Gain uh, Index, um, we have in 12 out of those 15, we already have humanitarian assistance um, uh, provided, humanitarian response plans, as we call them. Um, and not only that, not yesterday or the day before, no. Um, in Among those 12 countries, um, there are about six who have had a humanitarian response plan for 10 consecutive years, um, three, I think, for 15 years and more, and the rest for 20 years and more. So obviously climate change is not the only driver, um, but it is the driver that very often pushes um, communities and more communities over the edge into um, the need for um, humanitarian assistance. The increase um, in climate related disasters and affected people over the last 50 years has been 600%. So it is real and it is real for us. Floods and droughts, uh, floods and droughts are the majority, not all, but for us, um, it's primarily about floods and droughts. Floods have risen just over the last 20 years by 134%, droughts by 232%. And in many of these places, like in the Sahel, it's a permanent uh, feature. But in addition to those most vulnerable countries, and that's what I'm going to focus on, um, how we can get um, actually some of that money to those most vulnerable communities in some of those most vulnerable um, uh, countries and contexts. That's the exam question for us. But in addition, we have new and emerging hotspots in places that we thought we had left uh, behind in terms of humanitarian assistance um, a long time ago. We now have the droughts in Central America again. And for the first time, we've been having a humanitarian conversation um, with their representatives um, a few weeks um, ago. Not a, a real appeal yet, uh, but sort of a pre-stage. Um, we heard before from about the SIDS, uh, the Caribbean and, and, and many others. So what, I'm, what, we're, what we're getting at is that at a current scenario of 1.2 Celsius, um, we're already seeing all this disaster and the humanitarian system is inundated. 
between 30 and 40% um, globally of our requirements are not funded at the moment. We are hoping to cap at 1.5, which would already be an additional burden on the human, from a humanitarian uh, uh, point of view, test the limits of, of where we are. But we are on a trajectory of 2.7 Celsius increase. I, mean, I cannot even start to imagine the magnitude um, that this will um, have, particularly on those most vulnerable um, contexts. So for us, this is a relatively frightening um, uh, scenario on the on the way um, ahead, um, and so we have five transformational shifts that we propose, and and, and I think those go to your uh, in, to answer your your question. They respond to that urgency, but number one, we need to be much much better in terms of uh, of anticipation, um, preparedness, and earlier investments. We need to not only generate better and new information and research around the nexus of climate risks and their very impact on vulnerability and how they translate into humanitarian need. Um, there is circumstantial evidence, but we need to have some um, better academic um, uh, evidence uh, there. But what is clear is already the science that we have today, the information that we have today um, allows us uh, to invest much, much earlier both from a developmental um, and a humanitarian point of view um, in some of these contexts. The second um, shift is we need to be, we need to accept the protracted nature of these contexts. Not, that's not about development or, or humanitarian, that's just a fact. 10, 15, 20 years we're present in these, these contexts. Um, we need to have, we need to look at our types of programs, more social um, um, uh, protection, safety nets, um, uh, basic service uh, 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 provisions and, and, and connectivity. Um, and for that, we need to work differently together um, across, the, across that uh, famous divide you know, um, between humanitarian and development. Um, and that doesn't just uh, start or stop with the analysis. I, I don't think that we always have or that we're very good at having shared analysis, a shared understanding, shared priorities. But what we're not doing at all is in these places, among the humanitarian community with local um, um, actors and capacities, including the private sector and, and local governments, but also not with our own development uh, colleagues to work to common outcomes over two or three years, to give ourselves in terms of the priorities that we see to strengthen communities resilience, to give ourselves um, an outcome, a direction, an objective that we're trying to achieve very concretely and then work backwards from there and say, who can do what against this? And in that sense, the humanitarians must be part of this, but we're not the solution. Um, development uh, uh, needs to come in um, at a different rate. The third one is around this more integrated multidisciplinary approach, avoiding um, silos. Um, resilience, which is our focus in those most vulnerable countries is an integrated concept. And, and silos don't uh, deliver um, integrated uh, solutions. Um, the fourth one is we need to be much more inclusive in our ways, um, in our cooperation with local uh, communities, with local partners, uh, government, private sector, and so on. And the fifth one is we need to translate um, the knowledge that we discuss here um, uh, today, the science, the research that we have or may be getting um, much more effectively into local uh, contexts um, uh, because a lot of people do not relate their suffering or their decline in, uh, in income, in livelihoods um, to the very risks, uh, risk, uh, climate change risk factors or to climate change, full stop. So in closing, um, someone asked me yesterday at a, at a meeting, if you had one wish, uh, um, one message for the negotiators here, and I think we all have uh, um, a relatively common message here, uh, what would that be? And and I said, well, there has been a lot of talk about uh, Glasgow being a turning point, primarily around 1.5 and, and, and so on and so forth. But I do believe that what Glasgow absolutely needs to be is a turning point in the conversation around adaptation and, uh, and uh, adaptation financing. Um, if we want to not only in 2028 at the next stock taking meeting, 
but in the intervening years, because um, these crises are not going to wait, and, and the next decade is the one that delivers this um, major increase in, in humanitarian need around the world, um, we need to really um, leave from here with, with a much better um, um, idea of um, and, and, and reassurance, I want to say, uh, that climate um, adaptation financing or fin adaptation financing altogether is going to increase. And maybe just a final footnote. I fully Very support quick, because we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. Fifty percent of climate funding uh, to adaptation is is good, and that's the sector general. Everyone supports this. But what need it all needs to come together again at the country level. We we are at risk of, of opening up a myriad of different funding tools around adaptation, around uh, okay. around uh, these financing flows that do not come together at the country level. Thank you. Okay, let me let me start you there. Thank you very much. That was uh, very, very wide ranging and huge amounts of great material there, which will be available on the recording afterwards. I want to just give people 30 seconds to, to come back on anything they've heard or to, to just leave us with one thought as you've just done, Hans-Jörg, with, uh, you know, what's the most important Thing that you take from this. So Omar, if you have uh, still got your connection, um, you have 30 seconds to just give us a key insight or anything you've heard. And uh, after Omar, I'll, 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 I'll uh, just go through in the order of the speakers as well. So Dietrika and then uh, Jürgen and Berenice. I think Hans-Jörg's probably done his 30 seconds, but uh, I can't see Omar, but uh, Dietrika. Merci, merci. Oh, you there. Okay, <laughs> Comme vous great. Voyez, comme vous le voyez, j'ai voulu dire beaucoup de choses, mais c'est pour respecter le timing que je me suis limité uniquement à votre question. Alors, ce que je voudrais rajouter, c'est vous dire que la mise en place d'une assurance agricole pour un pays nécessite quand même l'appui des partenaires techniques au développement notamment la Banque mondiale, l'USAID, etc. Donc, c'est des partenaires qui appuient presque euh, la mise en place de cette assurance dans tous les pays et nous ne cesserons jamais de les appeler, euh, surtout avec le GIF, le Global Index Insurance Facility de la Banque mondiale, qui appuie vraiment les pays à mettre en place. Aujourd'hui, avec la réglementation de la CIMA, le défi, c'est de digitaliser les processus de vente de l'assurance pour permettre quand même une meilleure résilience aux, aux producteurs. Donc, c'est ce que j'avais à rajouter comme dernier point et dire que jamais on ne pourra parler des effets des changements climatiques et de leur adaptation en une heure de temps de panel. Mais je me réjouis d'avoir participé à ce, cet appel. Je vous remercie. Yes, I think we agree on that. But thank you so much, Omar, for joining us and thank you for your contributions. That's, that's great. Um, Deepshika, you have so, just quickly, I would like to add on that it is very important to secure the investments for the HKH region in terms of green, resilient and inclusive development. Uh, the HKH have a specific set of barriers that must be overcome to generate resources to create resilient economies and viable enterprises. Uh, the specific investment problems require specific investment solutions that can invest patient capital in low carbon development in the region, creating viable markets for the products and services from the Himalayan region and underwrite the risk of investing in the Himalayan region and make resilience investment to reduce them to a minimum. Along with this, uh, at EC Mode, we have developed, uh, as I already mentioned, an uh, investment framework in the process of developing the investment framework. And we are approaching various uh, uh, funding organization donors, both uh, in, at the national, regional, as well as the international levels, where we are looking forward towards the opportunities in the mountains for the climate adapted and carbon neutral uh, technologies and innovations in terms of whether it is a resilient in mountain infrastructure, entrepreneurial ecosystems, and inclusive and climate responsive financial landscape. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much for joining us, Deepshika, and, and uh, great to, that you got your remarks in such a short time to save us at the end. Thank you. And uh, Jorgen, would you like to say a few words just in closing? Yes, very quickly. I think we have three challenges. We have a protection gap, we have to deal with compound risks, and we have a gap in the global architecture. So the protection gap is very much about vulnerable groups, 
islanders and people living on low-lying coastlines, smallholders and herders, urban dwellers. The compound risk, I don't have to explain. We all know that risks are coming together and, and getting really difficult uh, to manage. We have to look at that. And the last point is the gap in the, in the architecture, in the global architecture. And there we need to strengthen this architecture for climate and disaster risk financing. Mounting a protective and comprehensive protective shield, it needs to be more sustained and well-structured, building on existing financial channels and also including private engagement and investment. It should include elements targeted especially to LDCs, for example, premium subsidies for climate risk insurance. And we would like to, to look at that issue, in particular to our upcoming G7 um, presidency in 2022. We want to transform the GRIF into a truly global vehicle. And there, uh, we need your support. We need your openness to discuss uh, those issues going down the road. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and, and thanks for that, that level of, uh, of engagement, clarity, ambition that, that Germany is showing on these issues. I think that's very encouraging. Berenice, do you still have your connection just for 30 seconds? Sure, very, so very, very quickly, I mean, I think, agree with everything has, has been said. Clearly the, the, the challenges are huge. They're here today. They're not just for the future. Um, and um, what is also very clear is that, you know, the financing that we have, the public financing is not, is not gonna be um, right enough. So my, my sort of, in a nutshell, I would say, we need to continue to think out of the box. We need to come up with new ideas, new, new instruments that we can, you know, put out there at scale um, and, um, and, and, and to be able to address. So again, innovation, I think we need to be a little bit courageous, think out of the box, be creative, um, and, and really you know, find ways that we can uh, help, um, help, help those that are most affected. I'll leave Great. it there. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much. And Hans-Jörg, I, I was not going to give you the 30 seconds, but I'm happy to if you're still online. No, I'm okay. I, I said what I had to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, you did, and very clearly. And, and let me just thank all of you as, as panelists. I mean, it was a really tight time frame we gave you, and I think you've done a great job in getting over some very different perspectives, getting over the priorities for the future and the challenges that we're encountering now in, in handling, as you say, uh, as you're this, this really urgent and um, very serious crisis that's been going on for some time already. And uh, I think the report that we've done, you know, emphasizes that this is just going to, to, to be the start. And we, we're talking about uh, the extreme events. We've got the, the sea level rise, the increase in temperatures, the extreme heats, and then potentially tipping points as well coming through uh, even, even in this century. And I've noticed that the IPCC um, working group one report from AR6 couldn't even rule out the, the possibility of those large discontinuous changes, which, you know, would, would be, um, I think testing the system to, to beyond breaking point probably. So we, we, we really have a, a race to get the systems in place that, that will be effective to handle these challenges. And, and I just want to thank you all for, for your contributions today in, in helping to move that agenda forward. And the OECD looks forward to, to supporting action on this agenda uh, in the coming years as well. So thank you all very much. I think we're out of time. I'm sorry, Han, uh, Jens, I don't know if there's anything you'd just like to say at the end, a couple of words, but... Uh, Thank you very much, Simon. Maybe just just to say that you know, obviously, uh, we thought is, is is real. It's uh, and at the same time, it's a very direct reversal of developments. Um, I don't want to repeat many things. I think the one thing that came out very clearly it needs more attention. It needs more attention by donors, uh, and it needs more integrated approaches, uh, not fragmentation or siloing. So uh, clearly, it goes back to the core development challenges of capacity, access to finance, reducing cost of finance, clearly something that we'll keep focusing on. So um, with that, back to you. And thanks uh, very much from my side also to all our panelists. Yeah. Look forward to continuing engagement. And, and thanks very much to my team who helped organize this. You haven't seen much of them, but Nicolina Lamog, uh, Marcia Rocha, Balashtata, Mupa Chund, who have uh, been active behind the scenes and our technical teams as well. Thank you all very much and uh, 
have a good evening wherever you are and uh, hope to see you all soon again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.